Hi, this is Robin, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about and demonstrating how to wrap flat graphics onto two-dimensional image surfaces and shapes using displacement maps in Photoshop. Uh, so before I start, it probably needs some background or some context as to what this means and what it's all about. So first of all, to answer the question, what is a displacement map? Um, a displacement map is a grayscale, so in other words, a black and white copy of an image. And what it does is it simplifies the image's colors, highlights, and shadows into shades of gray. And when, with those shades of gray, what we do is we create a map, in air quotes, of the surface textures in a flat image. So what that does with that map is it lets you add flat elements such as illustrations, photos, text to your images so that they can realistically follow the wrinkles, the ripples, the folds, or in other words, the ups and downs on the surfaces in your original image. So if something has wrinkles such as this t-shirt, you can wrap this flat graphic or your flat graphic around the wrinkles so it doesn't look unrealistic as if you've just cut and pasted a flat graphic onto an image. It does The graphic doesn't just lay flat on top of the folds and the nooks and the crannies, so to speak. It actually wraps around them. So there are some basic things to think about when you're going to try this approach of using displacement maps and the kind of images you should use. So the considerations are, first of all, um, it's best if you work with contrasty base images. So either they have to start contrasty or you must adjust them so that your images do have more contrast in order to create an effective displacement map. Also, displacement maps must be saved as 8-bit per channel images. So if you try to save it as a 16-bit, you will get a little warning pop-up, so just know you'll need to go up to your image menu, if you see where my highlighter is here, go to mode and the flyout, and just be sure that your images are 8-bits per channel and not 16-bits per channel to be able to save them as a displacement map. And the final thing to keep in mind uh, before we do this is that displacement maps must be saved as native Photoshop documents. So in other words, it has to have a .psd file format extension. So that's the abbreviation for Photoshop document, .psd. So you cannot save a displacement map as a TIFF or a JPEG or something like that. It must be dot PSD. So there, what I'm going to show today is that it's a basically or roughly eight step image compositing technique that uh, displacement map applications is comprised of. So because it is a compositing technique, I'm going to be putting this video into my compositing series of videos on my channel. So if you want to look for it in the future, look under the compositing series. Uh, so the kinds of things that you can use displacement maps for, I mean, I guess it's helpful to know what the applications are to know if you want to do it or not, uh, is adding a flat graphic such as the one I have here, or it could be a logo. I'm going to take a quick drink of water. Sorry, I got scratchy. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm adding a flat graphic like a logo or some other illustration like the one here or a photo or even text to different materials or fabrics. So whether it's clothing, a flag, a tote bag, you know, what you want to be sure that whatever it is that you're applying the graphic to, you can be able to wrap it around the folds, the natural folds in that fabric. So that's a case where you would use a displacement map as if you want to wrap a flat graphic around a material of some sort. Also could be skin <laughs> if you want to do a tattoo. 
Um, you can also use it to add flat graphics to other textural surfaces, whether it's walls or sidewalks. So you think if you want to, in a composite, maybe make it look like some kids were doing chalk drawings on a sidewalk. Well, they can't just be lying on top of the sidewalk. They need to kind of fit into the graveliness of the sidewalk or the graininess of the sidewalk. So something like that would work. If you're doing a composite with a road and you want to add a stripe or some other text of some sort to the road, then you'll want it to, again, look like it's embedded into the pavement and not just floating on top of it. You can add textures, uh, images to rocks, or also if you're doing a more commercial kind of an application or marketing application. So let's say you're working with products where there's a ribbed metal can or a corrugated box. And again, you want to add either a logo or a label or something and have it fit to the surface of the object you're putting it onto, that's where a displacement map would be very useful. And then also you can use uh, add flat graphics or text to a person. So I'm going to show a demo with a fine art sort of an application or uh, approach. But again, as I said, you can use it to you put tattoo art onto a person, onto a neck, a face, an arm, a back, a chest, whatever. And it would either help you visualize if you want it for yourself. If you're a tattoo artist, you could show somebody what they would look like with it. Or again, if you're just adding a tattoo to someone in a composite, this is a way that you can do it and have it again, just not look like it's a flat graphic lying on top of some body part. Now, another application that's very useful for displacement maps is creating a rippled water effect where there was no water or adding realistic reflections onto ripples in water. But I'm not going to show that last approach in this demo. I'll save that for one of my future video workshops because I think there's already a lot to absorb just with the applications that I'm going to show you today. So speaking of which, um, I will show three demos in this video, and I will show how to work with displacement maps using a cross section of different Photoshop tools in each demo. And what I'm doing here is I wanna give you the flexibility to either have different methods you can choose from if you like one or another better, or I also want to be sure you have the flexibility that if for the graphics or the images that you're working with, one method of creating the displacement map doesn't work as well for creating that black and white layer, uh, you can have two other methods that you can have in your toolbox that you can go to and try instead. So the three demos that I'm going to show in this video are adding a flat graphic to a t-shirt. So that's this graphic to this t-shirt here. Uh, the second demo, I will add graffiti to a brick wall. And in the final third demo, I will wrap flat text over a person's face. And as I said, for me, I'm just doing this to show you what you could do if you're doing fine art sort of photographic art. And so this is an approach you could use for that. What I'm going to do is, because this will probably run along with the three different demos, is I will put the start times for each demo below my video uh, in the description in case you're most interested in one example or another, or if you want to re-review the different steps and just want to hop to a specific demo. So that way it'll save you not having to go through the entire video again. Also, um, as I usually like to mention, if you learned something new or find information helpful in the video, I really appreciate it if you click on the thumbs up like icon under the video. Uh, also, if you haven't done so already, uh, you can click on the subscribe button under the video to get a single notification directly from YouTube when I post future Photoshop demo videos to my channel. And I only do that once or twice a month, so it's not going to get excessive. And just know I don't send emails, so you won't be getting spam from me. All right, so let's dive into the uh, first demo for how to create and apply a displacement map. 
And as I said, what I'm going to be working with are these uh, images here. And it's going to be about adding a flat graphic, in this case an illustration. But in your case, you could use an illustration, a photo, a logo, whatever you want to use, or text even. And I'm going to apply that to the t-shirt that this guy is wearing here. So first thing I suggest you do is open both of the images that you want to work with. So I've got what I'll call my base image open, and that's the guy with the t-shirt. And I've got my flat graphic image open. So I suggest that you open them both too. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with the base image first, because that's going to form the basis for the displacement map. So what I always recommend doing, and I always do myself, is don't work on the background layer. Make a duplicate layer, and for any of your photo processing, not just displacement maps, and then work on the duplicate. So to do that, you go to your Layers panel, left click on that background layer, and drag it to the bottom of the Layers panel to the Add New Layer icon, which is the square with the plus, and here we get a duplicate layer. And then I'm just going to double click to be able to label this t-shirt guy. I like to label my layers just so when you get multiple layers, you can keep track of what you're doing. Also, um, if you haven't seen my videos before, I have customized my Photoshop interface. So a quickie tour, just so you know where to look relative to your own setup. So my layers panel is up here at the top. My Properties panel is down here at the bottom, and my toolbar is docked right. I am right-handed. My right eye is my dominant eye, so I just find it kind of uh, annoying and slow to have to keep hopping back and forth across my interface, so I keep everything to the right. Okay, so now with this duplicate layer of our base image, I'm going to be sure that layer is active, which it is with that blue highlight there. And I'm going to right click on that active layer, which brings up this menu, and then scroll down to where you see the word duplicate layer. And when duplicate layer is highlighted, left click. OK, and it will bring up this duplicate layer pop up box. Now you can just ignore where it says as right there and go to destination document and scroll across to where you see the little down arrow left click come down to where you see the word new be sure the word new is highlighted and left click on that so our destination document is new and then under name give your name uh, your displacement map a name so I'm going to call this t-shirt displacement map, and I'll abbreviate that. And then once you get it named, then just click OK. And what happens is then now you have created, or I have created for you to see, a duplicate layer. So let me pull these parts you can see. So if you look here in the file name, this is T-shirt displacement map. So that's the duplicate layer we just created. And my original is behind it. So what I want to do is, I, for me, I like to just cover it so I know what I'm working with and I don't accidentally start working on the original base image. So now we've got our displacement map duplicate layer open. So with that open, what we need to do, as I said right up front, is we need to convert this to a black and white image. Because as I said, you need to work with half tones in black and white to create a displacement map. So the first method I'm going to show you in this first demo is to use a black and white adjustment layer for that black and white conversion. So bottom of the layers panel, come down to the circle with the line through it, which is the add new adjustment layer left click on that you'll get the list of the different adjustment layers come down to where it says black and white and left click on that so now you can see in your layers panel a new black and white adjustment layer has been added and what has it done it has converted the color photo the base image duplicate 
to a black and white. So if yours looks okay, it might be good enough right where it is. But what we're trying to do, as I also said right up front, is get the most contrasty image, grayscale image possible in order to have distinguishable wrinkles, folds, ripples, surface elements that the, can be used to create the displacement map to wrap the flat graphic around. So while you're on the black and white adjustment layer, in your properties panel for that layer, you have a couple options. You can either come to all these different color sliders and start moving them around and seeing if you can achieve a more contrasty black and white um, layer that way. Or what I sort of like to do just to kind of cheat and hopefully find something good is in that same properties panel, there are presets right there. And the top one is default. So if we slide across to the little down arrow and left click, you see the list of the presets for the black and white adjustment layer. So if I and watch the image um, rather than where I'm clicking around here, so I'll just click on the top one, which is blue filter. And now what I can do is use my down arrow key to just cycle through those different uh, presets and see if there's a more contrasty look for this image. So let's see what we want to do here. And as each time, oh, so that one's more contrasty. That's the high contrast blue filter. So I'll remember that. And this dead air, if you're watching the image and not the right hand side, is me just clicking through each of the different presets. Yeah, so of those uh, different presets that I just clicked through, I thought that this high contrast blue filter was the best. And I just want you to be aware, I can't give you a formula for your images because each image that you work with and each image I work with is going to have different tonalities and different qualities to it. So it's all really trial and error to just scan through and find out what will work best for your image. But for this image, I'm going to pick high contrast blue. Okay, so now we've got that high contrast blue preset applied as our black and white adjustment for this to the first step for making the um, displacement map. So now what I'm going to do is add a stamp layer. So coming down to the bottom of the layers panel to that add new layer icon, which is the box with the plus, we do that. So we've added a new blank layer. And I'm just going to label this so that if you're reading it or want to stop it and look at it, you can see that this is a stamp layer and or going to become a stamp layer. And what a stamp layer is, is it basically is a single layer composite of everything that's come before it. And what it does is it gathers everything that you've done onto one layer, but without flattening the layers. So if you want to go back to your layers, you still have them intact. So to create this stamp layer, you have to do a maneuver that they often call the claw. And so I use two hands because you have to hold these four key combinations all down at the same time. So it's Shift, Control or Command, Alter Option, and E. And then you can see the image for the stamp layer has appeared there. So now the next thing we have to do in working to create this uh, displacement map is to blur this layer a bit. And the goal of why we create a very subtle, very light blur on this before we do the create and save the map is we want to remove any distractions of smaller details from the base image so that the displacement map will just capture the most notable ridges, wrinkles, textural shapes that we can wrap our flat graphics around. So what I'm going to do is make this image a little bit bigger so that we can see what we are working with. And you can see there's some little graininess and little lines in here that we don't want to, or at least I don't want to capture in my uh, displacement map. I want to capture the big things like these big folds here or maybe these pieces here and in here not all the little stuff in the t-shirt 
So with that stamp layer active, go to the top of your interface to the filter menu and come down to where it says blur and then go to the flyout menu and come down to where it says Gaussian blur. So filter menu, blur, Gaussian blur and left click. And we'll get this little pop out box for the Gaussian blur. Now, what you want to do, as I said, is be able to see these larger wrinkles, but not the small things. So I have this set to preview here for Gaussian blur so I can see what's going on. If you want to zoom out a little bit, click on the minus. And I think for me, I can see it better if it's there, but um, I can click on the plus if I want to see. To me, this looks a little too blurry for what I want mine to look like. So you can adjust your radius. The higher you go, the blurrier it'll get. The lower you go, the less blurry it'll get. So just go up gradually until you see some smoothing. That's actually pretty good. What happens if I go more? All right, I'm going to do mine at a radius of one pixel. And let's just come in here a little bit more so you can see it here too. And you can see it's smoothed out some of the background, but we've got the ripples. So I'm going to say this is good enough blur for mine. Once you get to yours to where you like the level of blur without it being too much blur, click the OK button to accept that. So this is the stamp layer plus, whoops, my spelling is off here. Gaussian blur. Okay, so just so you have that for reference. All right. So now, now that you have the Gaussian blur, I just want to be sure that I still have enough contrast because maybe after adding that blur, uh, it's lost some of the contrast that I liked from having done that black and white preset. So I'll show you another trick if you want to add back in some more contrast. So I am with this layer still active going to press my control. If you're on a Mac, it's a command. So control command L and that brings up this pop-up box and the levels L stands for levels. And then with that box up there and the histogram curve here, I'm going to go to my midtones handle down here and pull it to the right a little bit and see if I can just bring back a little bit more and maybe down at the shadows too, just a little bit more contrast there. Once And this is an optional step. If you felt like you still had enough contrast, you don't need to do it. But again, I like to show you these things so you have it at your disposal if you want. So if that added some more contrast that you like, then left click OK. All right, so now that we have the black and white, we've added a light blur. We've made sure we have enough contrast. Now we want to save this file as a displacement map. So first thing is to check and be sure, because I said again up front, it has to be an 8 bits per channel image. So let's go up to the top of the interface to the image menu, go to mode and fly across. And yes, it's 8 bits, so I'm OK. I don't need to convert it to a 8 bit image. Then, if it's ready to be saved, go to the File menu up at the top left of the interface. Come down to where it says Save As, left click. And I like to save my displacement maps to my desktop. So I'm going to left click to get the desktop over here. Um, you can create a folder if you want, but I just find it easier to grab from the desktop. And if you want to create a folder to move your displacement maps to after you've used them, you can do that. But just be aware that .psd files are very large and you could eat up a lot of memory. So I tend to, once I get my composites created, just discard those displacement maps. OK, so we have file save as. I am saving to the desktop. You can save either to the desktop or to a folder. And then we come down to the file name. So you can see it's saving the name that I had already given that duplicate file, which is t-shirt displacement map. 
And as I said again up front, very important, be sure you are saving as a Photoshop document or a .psd file type. So now we are ready to save. Click on Save down at the bottom here. Maximize compatibility, yes, OK. So now we have saved our displacement map. So now we can set this off to the side because that, if you want to make any adjustments to it, you can. But we're going to be going back to working with the base image and with the flat graphic at this point. So I'll just set that off to the side. So now we're back to working with our base image, which is the full color image. Make sure it's active. Click on it. So we're back there to our main image. And now what we want to do is move our flat graphic onto this image and create a composite. So make sure that the image is active, the flat graphic. And again, as usual, if we look over in the layers panel to the right, I like to duplicate and make sure that I'm working with the duplicate. So I drag that to the add new layer. They add the, the background layer to that add new layer icon, which is the box with the plus. We want to move this graphic over here. So in the toolbar, choose the tool that's the move tool, which looks like a cross. So left click on that. And there's two ways you can tell it's active. There's the black highlight behind it. And also on your image that you want to move, you get this pink bounding box with handles around it. So you can left click anywhere in this image as long as you don't click on this little widget in the center and then left click and drag that over to your base image. And yes, I want to accept that. <laughs> so as you can see, uh, this has gotten to be a really, really huge image relative to my base image. But the first thing you want to do before you do anything, once you move your flat graphic into onto your base image, and you can see it's here. So let's just label this so you know that this is the flat graphic or t-shirt. Okay, so the first thing you do once you get that into the new layer stack is right click on that active layer over here in the empty area and then come down to where it says convert to smart object and left click on that convert to smart object when it's highlighted. And so now it has been converted to a smart object. Now, let me show you how you can tell. So when you look at these two different thumbnails in the layers panel, they're just plain little thumbnails. But you can see that now there is a little icon added in the lower right corner of this new layer where we have added the smart object. So that little icon tells you that this is now a smart object. And what the smart object means is that <laughs> you can you're basically putting your image into a safety envelope, I guess, or a safety box, whatever you want to think of it as being. And it lets you make adjustments like scaling or resizing or distorting the image without destroying your original graphic that's inside that envelope. So let's say you make your image too small and then you want to make it bigger again uh, with scaling or resizing. Each time you change the sizing, you are taking pixels away from your original image. So that means you're destroying the overall resolution or quality of your original image. And you don't want to do that. So this smart object will let you resize, as this clearly needs to have done, without doing any damage. OK, so we have the smart object applied. So now what I need to do is scale this flat graphic down so it'll fit onto that t-shirt. So with that layer active, going to the edit menu at the upper left, come down to either, you have to, a choice. <laughs> you can go to transform scale or you can go to free transform and I'll just use free transform for now. So these pink lines will pop up. Now because this is so huge, <laughs> the outlines and the bounding box for the graphic are outside the view of visibility here. So that's not helpful. We can't see it. The way to get this so that it is visible and in the view that you can work with 
is, uh, again, I'm working on a PC, so I've got control. So control or command zero all together. And there you go. You can see now we can see the bounding boxes. We can see the adjustment handles and we can make this a smaller size to fit on that t-shirt. You want to keep the aspect ratio of your graphic. Don't distort it unless you purposely want to distort it. But if you don't want it distorted, you need to retain the aspect ratio. The way I will do that is I am using the legacy approach in my setup for Photoshop, which means I need to press and hold the shift key before grabbing any of these handles and moving something down if I want to retain the aspect ratio. The newer default is that you can just grab the handles and pull it down and it will retain it. So you just need to know how your Photoshop is set up and you can set that up in your preferences. So anyway, we're going to either use the shift key or not, grab the handle and then just start dragging it down to make this more of a size that'll fit onto that t-shirt or onto your image. So you can see I've gotten it a little bit smaller there. So now I'm going to make my image bigger so that we can see where it will fit on here. Clearly, so I'm not going to accept this transform yet because clearly I still need to make this a little smaller. And then I'm just clicking inside to, while it's still being scaled, to reposition where this is and to see. One of the things that you could do, and first of all, I'll make my image bigger so that it's just my base image bigger so it's easier to see the sizing. And that's actually not a bad size. I think I'll just leave it that size. Um, but what you can do is if with the graphic you're using, you can't really see where you're positioning it, come over to your layers panel on the right and down to where it says opacity. And with that graphic layer active, see what I'm doing? Watch the graphics. Eh? You can lower the opacity, which lets you see where it's being placed and position it. Now, when I do compositing, I like to try to do photorealistic compositing. I don't want it to look like a collage. So I have to think of realistic things about how things would look in real life. Now, if this graphic was on this t-shirt and this is sort of sideways on his neck and hanging sideways in real life, unless it was a badly manufactured t-shirt, this would probably have to tilt a little bit to tilt with the direction of what his t-shirt is and how he's wearing it and how it's falling on his body. So if you pull that out just outside the handle, watch, see where my yellow highlighter is? Look at that. The arrow gets a little bendy look and that means you can rotate just outside of the image. Okay, so once you get it resized and positioned where you want it, put your opacity back to full 100% opacity if you adjusted it, if you didn't, fine come to the top of the interface and click on the check mark to accept the transformation. So now it's accepted. And what I like to do is get off of the move tool so I don't accidentally move something. And my neutral tool I always go back to is the lasso. You don't have to do that, but that's what I prefer to do. Okay, so now we have our flat graphic over our t-shirt and you can see what I'm saying here. That doesn't look at all realistic. Even if you were to mask this off of his hands and his outer shirt, it's not gonna, it's just a flat cutout lying on top. So this is where with this graphic layer active, we want to apply our displacement map that we saved earlier. So to do that, we make sure that layer is active, go to the top of the interface to the filter menu, come down to where it says distort and go to the flyout menu and come down to where it says displace. So filter, distort, displace, left click. And we'll get this little pop-up box that says, okay, we are in displace and we have some options here. Now, the default settings that you'll see here for the magnitude of displacement are 10 and 10. And you can change those numbers to suit your taste. I typically use them on the same numbers in both cases, but you can experiment and see what happens if you use different numbers there. Um, displacement map, 
I like it to stretch to fit. So if it's trying to fit into a space, I want it to automatically do that. So I leave this setting stretch to fit clicked as on. And once you set it, you won't have to set it again. As far as undefined areas, I like to set it so that the undefined areas, it will repeat the edge pixels. So I leave that clicked to on. And because I told you and recommended that you use a smart object and work with a smart object, I want to embed the file data that we work with the displacement map into that smart object. So I have that clicked to on. So you need to decide how much you want your flat image to wrap around these curves in the map. And 10 is, as I said, the default, but you can go higher than that too. So I think I'm going to try a little bit more for my image. I'm going to change mine to 12 and see what that does because we have uh, saved it as part of a smart object, we can make it alterations to it going forward. Okay, so let's click OK. Now, after you click OK, after you get the parameters set, it will ask you to choose a displacement map. Can you see this up at the top? Choose just So again, since I saved mine on the desktop, I'm looking for the file that said t-shirt displacement map. So there it is. So left click on whatever you named your displacement map, the PSD file, and click open. And do you see what it did? It totally warped and distorted this displacement map. Okay, so um, now we can adjust it even further. So again, even though it has mated some uh, distortions and adjustments, and look at, you can see what it's doing here. It's wrapped it around some of the wrinkles, and it's wrapped it some around some of the wrinkles that appear up here, but that still doesn't look realistic. So there's three steps that you can think of for the finishing steps to actually finalize your displacement map application of your flat graphic. So the first thing to look at, depending on your image, certainly it's needed for mine, is does this need a layer mask added? And definitely for mine, it does. So on this layer, because we're still working on the flat graphic layer, I'm going to come to the bottom of the layers panel to this square with the circle in it, which is the layer mask. I kind of left click and you can see it's added a layer mask and it's added a white layer mask by default. Um, hopefully you're familiar with masks in Photoshop. If not, um, the white layer mask means that everything on that layer is revealed. If it were a entirely black layer mask, everything on that layer would be hidden. But what we want to do is have mostly everything revealed, so that's the white, but we want to selectively cover the pieces like over his outer shirt and his hands that we don't want showing. So we will have to paint black onto the layer mask because black will hide, white will show. Uh, in order to get rid of the excess pieces of this graphic. So in your toolbar, come down to the brush tool, which looks like a little paintbrush, and left click on that. You can see it's active because there's the black behind it. Come all the way down to the bottom and make sure that your foreground color in your color picker is black. And you want to be painting away any excess content on the mask. Definitely do not paint on your graphic. You'll ruin your graphic. And the way you tell the mask is active is because there's a white frame around it. So let's make this a little bit larger so we can see what we're painting. And again, I am going to lower the opacity so that I can see where to paint because right now that's a matte graphic. Okay, so I think that's enough where I can see the outlines. All right, I've got my brush tool active. I've got foreground color black, and I'm working on the white mask. So now you can see that black circle. That's my brush. So if you want to make it smaller, use the left bracket key. If you want to make it larger, use the right bracket key. So I'm not going to get too perfectionist about this because I'm just doing this for a demo to show you, so you just need the principles of it. You don't need me to create a perfect composite. But what I'm trying to do is paint away 
the over shirt and anything where the graphic spilled onto his hands. I'll use the left bracket to make this a little smaller because the point is to get the graphic so it looks like it's on the t-shirt and not on his hands or the outer shirt. And if, uh, since I have the black, let's say I went over there a little bit, if you want to switch to the white, you don't need to go all the way over here. You can use your X key and that puts white into the foreground so you can just alternate between the X key. All right, now I'm back to the black again so I can go a little bit larger with the right, right <laughs> bracket key. How's that for a tongue twister? And again, I'm trying to paint the graphic off of his outer shirt and I'll go a little smaller with the left bracket key to get it off of his fingers or hand over here. So again, anywhere where you have excess spill, you can paint it away. I'm going to use the white just to put back a little bit more there and a little bit more here and the black just to get it off of his fingers. Okay, so again, I said I'm not going to get too perfectionist. So then once um, you get it masked the way you want, let me just show you what the mask looks like so you can see. So that's where I painted with black to get the graphic off of his shirt and hands. So we'll put the opacity back to 100%. The next thing that you do after you decide if there's any masking needed is to do finishing in displacement maps, you probably are going to want to add a blend mode so that it, you can see where it's fitting around the different curves and bumps and ripples. So go to your layers panel, see where the word normal is. That's the very top of the list for the blend modes. There's a little down arrow, left click on that, and this will show you all the different blend modes. So all you have to do is mouse over or hover over the different blend mode names and you'll see it if you watch the image versus me scrolling, you'll see that it's changing the appearance of this graphic. So again, this is another trial and error for your image and for each of the images you because it will vary to figure out what is the best blend mode to use on the displacement map for your image to make it look good. And as I was scrolling through here, I kind of like darken and multiply. I think I like darken because it's retained more of the brightness of the color. Um, just to show you quickly, more often than not, I find that darken multiply, linear burn, overlay, and soft light are the blend modes that I tend to like to use. So you can just though hover over each one and see because you might want to go for a really funky look. Okay, so we've got this blend mode of darken applied. And again, so now we're seeing where the map, the displacement map is applying to the ripples a little bit better. The next thing to help do that even better is to lower the opacity. So just scroll over from where you were working with the blend modes and go to opacity. And you have two ways you can work with this. So one is to go to the little down arrow and you get a slider. You can slide to the left to lessen the opacity. Or you can do what I prefer, which is to just left click and drag on the word opacity. And that will lower the opacity. And if you watch the image, you'll see the opacity is going down. Now, let me just scroll out a little bit so I can look at this in the context of the whole image. So again, I like to think about this as a composite. So he's wearing really faded jeans. He's got kind of faded tattoos. Kind of his whole look isn't like new and crispy. His shirts are wrinkled. So he's not going for a, he just bought this, you know, at uh, Anthropology or wherever. <laughs> and now he's, you know, wanting his crispy new t-shirt. He's going for kind of a faded vintage look. So I want the graphic to fit in with that on this t-shirt. So I'm going to keep lowering it a little bit just so it looks like he's washed this t-shirt a number of times to get that faded look or else bought given that it's Jimi Hendrix, a vintage t-shirt, so it's got kind of a faded look to it. And let me get this a little bigger again just to see. Yeah, so to me, that looks really good for this image for my taste. And you can see that by doing that, we've taken this flat graphic 
and we have overlaid it using displacement maps and masking and blend modes and lowered opacity in order to get it so that it is conforming to and you can see the wrinkles and it's bending around the wrinkles in the t-shirt so for compositing purposes it looks like a realistic graphic on that t-shirt so just to again show you we've gone from the starting image of the guy with a white t-shirt to him with the graphic flat graphic added to his t-shirt so that is the end of demo number one which was using the black and white adjustment layer to create the black and white duplicate layer for the displacement map so we can close out this and move on to the second demo. Let me save no, save no, and close that displacement map file. Okay. So now let's move on to the second demo. And in this demo, what I want to do is add a flat graphic to a brick wall to make it look like I'm adding graffiti to a wall. So again, this is a good approach. And you can also use the black and white adjustment to make layer approach, but I just want to show you a different method so you have some choices. Uh, you can use this to apply a flat graphic to any textural surface. So the black uh, brick wall here is going to be my base image this time, just like the guy was my base image for the first demo. And let me just get these set up and then I can start talking you through this. And this is what I want to use as my graph flat graphic for my graffiti. And you'll see that um, this is a PNG file. So I have already selected this graphic to use for this application. And I'm not going to show how to do selections because this is uh, strictly a tutorial and workshop on how to work with displacement maps. But I do have other video tutorials in my channel about how to make selections and how to refine selections so that if you do want to select a graphic to use and apply onto a textural surface, you can watch those to learn how to make the selections. So anyway, this is my flat graphic I'm going to add to this wall. So let me get this up here so we can see what we're doing. Okay, so again, the first step is to make sure that you open both images. So we've got the flat graphic and I'm going to do my usual thing and duplicate this so we're not working on the original layer. And so again, bottom of the layers panel, we drag this down to the add new layer icon, which is the box with the plus. And this will be my graffiti graphic. Okay. And then we'll click on the other file. Same thing. I'm going to drag the background layer down to the bottom of the layers panel to add new adjust, uh, add new layer. Sorry. And then this is going to be my black brick wall. And that's the base image. Okay. All right. So now with those two images open and duplicated. We want to do the same thing that I did in the first demo. So again, make sure this is active. Make sure that layer is active. And we're going to right click on this layer. Come down to where it says duplicate layer right there and left click. And so now again, we've got the pop up box. Just ignore this. Come down to where it says destination document and go to that down arrow and click new. So you want the destination document to say new and I am going to name this. So again, name your displacement map. For mine, I'm calling it the brick wall displacement map. 
okay and then click OK to accept that. So now, same thing as before, we'll, it will sort of collapsed up, but we should have duplicate layers. So this is the brick wall displacement map. So just be sure you're working on the right thing. And this is the original brick wall base. So I want to be working on this brick wall displacement map. Even though it's a black wall, I do want to go through the steps to make sure that it's converted to a black and white or a grayscale image that we can create the uh, displacement map from. So as I said, in the first demo, we used a black and white adjustment layer to make the conversion. This time, I'm going to use a gradient map adjustment layer so you can see a different approach. So the first thing we want to do is come to the bottom of your toolbar and make sure that in your color picker your black is your foreground color and white is the background color. Then go to the layers panel, go to the bottom of the layers panel to that circle with the line through it which is the icon for the adjustment layers and come down almost all the way to the bottom to where it says gradient map. Left click on gradient map Okay, and now you can see the properties panel shows that we are in the gradient map because we've got that black to white gradient showing. Now, what you want to do, and you can see it's also <laughs> made this a real black and white versus the photographic black and white. So this is a pure black and white. So what we want to do is we want to make adjustments because as I said right up front, you want to get more contrast in these images in order to create the displacement map. So to do that, we come to the Properties map panel for the gradient map layer, left click once on that gradient map, that little uh, color strip, and what that does is it brings up the gradient map uh, editor, so the gradient editor. And so just come all the way down to where we have the gradient map showing. And what it has is the darkest colors where they'll map to the brightest colors where they'll map. And below that gradient, there are what are called little color stop handles. There's one at the black end and there's one at the white end. Because my image is very dark, to add contrast, what I need to do is add more white so we get more contrast in this image. You have to decide for your image whether you want to add more black or you want to add more white to get more contrast into the image you're working with. So let me slide this out of the way so we can see. Because mine is primarily black, I'm going to work with the white color stop handle. I'm going to left click on that and just start dragging a little bit at a time and then you can release it and just see what it's doing. And I want to keep pulling this over and checking it from time to time till I can see enough white in there that it'll create enough contrast that will make for a good displacement map. Because I want to get all those ridges in those bricks for the graffiti to wrap around. That's why I want the contrast and that's why I'm mapping where those ridges are. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there because I think that's good. We've gotten where I'm going to put the graffiti is right in the center. So you kind of have to know what area you're going to work with. So for me, I think I've got good contrast there. Um, the other thing you can work with is there's also what appears is once you click on one of these uh, shadow or highlight or black or white color stop handles, what appears is this little tiny diamond in the center for the midtones. So maybe we can pull some more white into the midtones too. So just gently left click into that little diamond and then you can, if you want to add more white, pull it to the left. If you want to add more black, pull it to the right. And let me just look at the image for a moment. All right, yeah, that looks pretty good. So we've added a, a good amount of white in contrast to this image. Let me just tell you, when you're working uh, with this gradient and with the color stops, if you accidentally click somewhere in the wrong place and another color stop handle appears below the gradient and you don't want it there, you can just left click on it and just drag it up in a way and it'll just disappear. You don't need to start over again. Okay, so for my image, I think I feel good that for this brick wall displacement map, contrast setting. I've got it where I want it with the gradient map. So I'm going to come up to the top of this pop-out box and click OK to accept that. 
All right, so now in our duplicate layer that we're building the displacement map with, we've got the gradient map for the adjustments. What did we do in the last demo? The next thing we have to do is create a stamp layer because we want to add some Gaussian blur and we can't do it to here. So come down to the bottom of your layers panel to the add new layer icon, which is the box with the plus. We got the blank layer and we're going to do another what I call the stamp layer maneuver here. So to make that a stamp layer, because right now it's an empty layer, we're going to do that four key combination all held down at the same time. So shift, con controller command, alter option, and E. And there you can see it's created the stamp layer above these other layers. So now with that stamp layer active, <laughs> we can add a blur, again, the subtle Gaussian blur, to this layer. So come to the top of the interface to the filter menu, left click on filter, come down to where it says blur, slide across to the flyout menu and come down and highlight and click on Gaussian blur. So filter, blur, Gaussian blur. Okay, and again, we'll get the little pop-up box that says we're in Gaussian blur. And if you can't see enough of your image, if you have it on preview there, you can just click these little magnifying glass things and zoom in or out to see. And I'm just going to move that around a little bit. So, Because what I'm trying to look for, just so you know what I'm looking for, is both the big edges where I want the graphic to wrap around, but also the surface texture of, in my case, the bricks. Because I don't want all that little surface tension. A texture because that will get confusing to the map and to the graphic. I would just want the big ridges that the map will make the graphic wrap around. Okay, so for mine uh, here, let's just look and see. So the one does not, so the one radius for Gaussian blur doesn't seem to be getting rid of or smoothing enough uh, the surface texture of the bricks. So I'm just going to keep sliding up and see what happens just gradually because as I said before you don't want more than necessary for this because it'll just make a blurry mess of things you want to keep the contrast and I think for me that's getting close I think I want somewhere in between so let's split the difference between 3.0 and 3.2 I'll do 3.1 so for me I feel like I've still got good contrast on the edges of the bricks, but I've smoothed out some of the surface texture texture on the bricks themselves. So I'm going to click OK to accept that level of Gaussian blur. All right, so now that we have the contrast in black and white and we've got the slight blur added to this, now we want to save this as a displacement map. So again, quick check if you didn't check already to make sure that you're in an 8-bit per channel image, which we are. Then come over to the File menu at the top left of the interface. Come down to where it says Save As. Left click. Be sure you're on the desktop or wherever you want to save your displacement map. And because we named it earlier, or at least I recommended naming it earlier, I already have the file name in there. And make sure that it is a Photoshop type, so a .psd file type. And we've got it where we want, so we can click Save. Yes, to maximize the compatibility. And it did it, so now I can make this smaller and just set it aside for now and go back to working with my original base image. Let me just get this smaller get it out of the way and I'll move that down there okay so now we're going to go back to our base image so again this is be sure you're on your base image and not working on your displacement map again we've got the top duplicate layer active so now we need to move our flat graphic onto the textural surface base layer 
And as I said, in my case, I'm working with this flat love graphic that I'm calling a graffiti. So I'm going to make sure this is active, make sure the layer in the layer panel is active. Going to go to the top of the toolbar to the move tool, which is that cross symbol, left click on that. Make sure the black is behind it to show it's active. And you should have pink bounding box around the element that you want to move into your image, the flat graphic you want to move into your textural base image. You can left click inside the bounding box, just not on the widget, and drag that over into your image. Okay, so now we have moved that there. And I personally, as I said, like to get off of the move tool once I've put something someplace. So I'll put this back to my neutral lasso tool. First thing you do when you get your graphic into as a composite onto and over your base layer is right click on that same layer as the graphic and convert it to a smart object. So convert to smart object, right click on layer, convert to smart object. Yes. And you get the little icon in the lower right corner that tells you it's now a smart object. Now, I know if I were a graffiti artist, I probably wouldn't want to put this subtle little graphic right in the center of a wall. So I think I'd probably want it to take up more space and be more visible. So let's resize this to be larger on the wall. And again, we've got it as a smart object, so that should protect the resolution and the image quality of the flat graphic, even if we resize it up and down. So with that layer active, go to Edit, Transform Scale, or Edit Free Transform. I'm going to go with that. You'll get the bounding boxes. You want to retain the aspect ratio, probably, of your graphics. So in my case, I'm going to press and hold Shift. If you're using the new system, you don't need to do that to maintain the aspect ratio. And I'm going to just pull this down a little lower so that my graffiti takes up more of the wall. And then again, as I said earlier, if you come out to outside of the pink bounding box and just hover just outside of the right one, any of the handles there, the corner handles, you're, I, I can't show you in there, it, the little arrows become these bendy looking things so you can rotate just by staying outside of the handles. And I think other than if your bank sees, probably somebody's going to have this more crooked. So I'm going to accept that transform. The pink box will go away. And so now we've got our flat graphic just lying on top of this wall. Okay, so now that we've resized, the next thing that we need to do is apply the displacement map that we saved earlier to this image. So again, with this graphic layer active, come up to the top of the interface to filter, distort, displace. Filter, distort, displace, left click. And again, we get this little pop-up box that tells us how much we want the magnitude of the displacement to be on our image. Now, <laughs> Again, I said before, if you didn't see the earlier demo, that you can start with 10 as the uh, easiest or lightest or the default displacement. Because I have this brick wall, I think I'm going to need more distortion than 10 or 12. So I'm going to start at about 15 and see if that will work OK for my image. And I don't need to adjust these other settings because I already had them set by default as stretch to fit, repeat edge pixels. And because I'm working on a smart object layer, it just stays clicked on to embed the file data in the smart object. So I've made my level of displacement adjustment there. Click OK. It'll take you to wherever you saved your displacement map. In my case, it's on the desktop. Find that file for that image, brick wall displacement map, open. Okay, it'll think and do its little thing. And you can see it's added some ridges and displacement to the graphic. I mean, it certainly is bendier and ridgier than what this is. 
but I think because it's on the brick wall and I just want it to be a little bit more distorted and I want to show you how to be able to adjust the amount of displacement, what we do is, again, because it's a smart object, now if you look in the layers panel on the right here, you can see it's added a layer, a sub layer for displacement. So if you left click on that, it'll bring up this box again so that you can make an adjustment. So in my case, I'm going to try, let's bump this up to 25. And that's going to be 25. Don't need to change any of this. Once you get it set, it just stays there. And click OK. It will take you back, so you have to reapply the displacement map because you're telling the displacement map how much to displace with those parameters. So click on your displacement map and click Open. It'll think. And it's added. Yeah, so you can see it's added even more ripples to that. Okay, so as I said in my last demo, then you get to the uh, finishing touches, as I like to call it, with regard to applying the displacement map to the flat graphic. So the first thing to ask yourself is, do you need any masking? No, this doesn't need any masking because the entire image is supposed to be showing on this base image. The next question is, okay, we need to, it's not so much a question as an action. <laughs> the next thing we need to do is add a blend mode to better integrate the flat graphic onto the background surface. surface. So we go to the top of the layers panel, come down to where it says normal, because that's the top of the blend modes, click on that little down arrow, and then just start mousing over until you find the one that you like the look of. And you can see what it's doing on the image versus watching where I'm mousing over. And this is how you decide, because again, it will be, oops, it will be trial and error for you and your image. It's not like every time you're going to use the same blend mode because different images will look different and you might want to go for a funky look so I can't give you a formula or look. So overlay isn't bad at all. Soft light is good. Oh no, so overlay for me is better than soft light because it keeps some of the bright neon look. Let's just keep going here and see if there's anything better that I want to apply. No. Okay, so of those two, I liked Overlay the best. So click on to activate and implement the blend mode that you want. So in my case, it's going to be Overlay. You will have something different. <laughs> now, the next thing that you typically need to do after you've applied the flat graphic and uh, added the blend mode is to adjust opacity to taste. Well, you saw that I definitely adjusted the opacity a lot on the t-shirt graphic. But because this wall is so dark, I don't want to take any, because it'll just really disappear a lot. I mean, I can do it a little bit just to show you, but um, it's going to start disappearing a lot on this. So just use your own taste for your own image, but by adjusting the opacity, it will help the flat graphic conform to the base image texture better. Okay, now, because my image has ended up, all right, so let me just say, this is essentially finished. So, I mean, if you want to stop here for your image and whatever you're working with, that's the end of the displacement map process. So you could stop right here if you want to. Optionally, I'm going to show you something else because I like to keep going and post-processing beyond. And just if you end up with something like mine, you might want to know, okay, you can continue to post-process beyond here. So for anybody watching this, this part I'm going to do now is optional and will depend on your image versus mine. So this is still kind of dark to me. And something I like to do when I'm making composites is think about what is the story that I'm trying to tell with the composite and what will sell the story. To me, I like to think of this as, okay, maybe a cop or policeman, a police person is walking down a dark alley and they've just seen that this new graffiti has been added to this wall. So they've turned and, and they're shining their flashlight 
on this to see what it is or if it's okay to stay there or if it's something that needs to be gotten rid of. So when I think of that story, I think, how can I make that happen visually in Photoshop? So one of the things is if you're going to be shining a flashlight on this, you want it to be brighter. So I'm going to go to my layers panel and go down to the adjustment layers, which is that circle with the line through it. And I'm going to add some more exposure to this scene because right now it is kind of dark to see what we want to see. So left click. And now I've added here in the layers stack an exposure layer. In the properties panel for that layer, uh, we have the exposure slider. So I am going to just click on that slider and see if I can add. There we go. That's sort of making it pop a little bit more. It's making it, giving it a little bit more dimensionality with the brightness. Plus, it'll help sell that idea of the flashlight shining onto that area. The thing is, is that when we add something like an exposure layer, it's going to add it globally to the entire image that's showing. And I don't want to do that because if it's a beam of light from a flashlight, it will probably be kind of circular. So the thing I'm going to do is want to add a, fit, a vignette to this that just highlights the center area. I'm going to click on my mask for the exposure layer and I'm going to click on alter option and drag that down to the trash icon at the bottom of the layers panel. So now we have an exposure adjustment layer with no mask. And what I'm going to do is in the toolbar come to click on this. So that's the rectangular marquee. I want to fly out a little bit for those hidden tools from that little triangle and grab the elliptical marquee. So now we have the elliptical, this more oval tool active. On my image, I'm going to come over with that elliptical marquee tool active. I'm going to click and just keep it clicked and drag out an oval area around my graffiti. And if you don't get it right where you want, so I'm going to show you how to do this just so you know how to adjust it. With the Marching Ants active, come up to Select Menu at the upper left, down to Transform Selection, and then I'm going to click on this center handle and just pull this up a little bit so we get a little bit wider circle of oval around that, and then just click on the check mark to accept it. So now we have a selection of marching ants around this that's going to become the area enclosed in this area is where that flashlight light is shining. And outside, it should remain the color that the wall was before the exposure was, laid, was added. So with that marching ants selection active, come back over, make sure your exposure layer is active. Come to the bottom of the layers panel to this square with the circle in it, which is the add layer mask and left click. And there we've added a new mask to that layer. And you can see if I click this on and off, it's just adding that light selectively to the center of that image. Now, again, all of this has nothing to do with displacement maps. It's just going to show you that once you've created your displacement map image, you can do some further post-processing to sell what you're making in the composite. Now, if I look at this, it has kind of a harsh edge to it, even though it's around the brick. But uh, So uh, with the mask active, come down to the Properties panel or up to the Properties panel, depending on where yours is. And what we want to do is feather that mask. So see the word feather, grab that little slider handle and just pull it more towards the right. And the more you pull it towards the right, the softer it will get. And let me just show you the mask. See, so it's made the edges softer, so it's not such a defined edge. So now we have kind of a nice diffused <laughs> flashlight kind of a look there. Uh, before behind or around <laughs> that uh, flashlighted graffiti. Now, there's another thing you can do here and another optional kind of an approach. 
that we can do. And I think maybe I'll show you that too, just so that you have this at your disposal. Because this was painted onto a brick wall, it's out in the elements. It could be getting chipped away from the weather or it could be fading. And by the way, you could use this optional step also with something like the t-shirt level to make it look like light is shining uh, on the folds where they're standing up and stuff. So we're going to try to use something called blend if, which is a layer style. And so what I want to do is be sure, first of all, you're back on your flat graphic layer. So I'm going to left click there and make sure that the blue highlight is on that graphic layer. And what we're going to do here now is go to and click on the layer style. So just click someplace where there's no text and double click and bring up the layer style box right here. So it says layer style. And in the center of the box, come down to where it says blend if. And what this is going to do is we're going to work on the slider bar, the bar here for the underlying layer. So the graffiti, the graphic is the current layer. So let me just show you this. So we're on the current layer, which is the graffiti graphic. And we want to work with the underlying layer, which is the base brick wall. So with that slider, because I have a dark background, I want to remove some of the darkness and just make it look. So let me do it extreme. So you can see what it's doing when I pull it to the right. It's taking away some of Look at the graphic, not where I am on the slider. It's taking some of that away. If we were on the t-shirt example, it would be an underlying white layer. So you'd want to, if you want to take away some of the graphic, you'd pull it from the white side, but we're on a black wall. So underlying layer, you grab that little handle and just start pulling it in. And again, it's going to be trial and error for your image. And I just want to make it look like some of it is fading away or disappearing from the weather. If it gets too extreme and it's taking too much away, you can, there's a way you can do a more subtle transition of what it's taking away. You press Alt or Option and left click on that handle. And what it does is, let me show you, it splits it into two parts. So let me separate them so you can see. See, there's two parts there now. And so you can control the amount of the transition more subtly if you have those split apart. So again, to do that, you would click and hold Alter Option on the center of the handle, and it would work for any of these handles. And then you can just move them independently. And let's just say I've got that where I want it. And then once you get your blend if applied, then click OK to accept it. So now I'd say we're at the end of this second demo where in this time we I used and demonstrated how to use the gradient map adjustment layer to create the black and white displacement map. We also then used a different flat graphic onto a darker surface so we showed how to deal with something if you have darkness and still get more contrast in there. We were showing how to change the amount of the displacement or the magnitude of the displacement by working with that displacement layer inside the smart object if we had to go back and make it either more extreme or less extreme. And then we also got the optional steps of adding some more exposure or brightness or saturation or whatever it is you want to add to your image by adding an additional adjustment layer and then coming back to the graphic layer and then using the blend if that's available in the layer styles to just possibly tweak it so that we are, have this looking more like it's integrated. The, gra the flat graphic is integrated better into the base image. So now if we look at what we started with and what we've ended up with, that's the difference of putting the graffiti onto the brick wall. So that is the end of my second demo. I've got one more demo in this video for you, and we'll show you yet another method that you can use to create the displacement map. So let me take a moment and close out these, and then we'll get to that final demo. 
I don't want to save. I don't want to save this graphic. I don't want to save the displacement map. So, okay, we'll move on to demo number three. And in this demo, I'm going to show how to wrap flat text onto a face. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm looking at this as more of a fine art application, but you could certainly do something similar uh, for a tattoo or something of that nature. Uh, but I wanted to show you how to work with text and not just uh, graphics, whether they're illustrations, photos, logos, whatever. Okay, so we have this girl's face is going to be the base graphic. And this handwritten Shakespeare sonnet is what I'm going to add and wrap around the contours of her face. So let me put that there. Let me get this straightened up here so we can work with this. Okay, so again, as I like to recommend for doing this, have both of your images or your multiple images, whatever you're going to work with, open. So we have the flat graphic and we have what I call the base image that we'll use to create the displacement map from open. And it's also the image that we're going to overlay our graphic onto once we get our uh, displacement map built. Uh, so now what I want to do is again make sure that this layer, it, the base background layer is duplicated because I don't like to work on my original. So drag your background to the bottom of the layers panel to the add new layer icon which is the square with the plus and I'm going to call this girl girl face okay and then I'll do the same thing with this graphic so I've activated that by clicking on it and drag it to the bottom of the layer panel to the add new layer icon and this will be the sonnet text okay go back to her and I'm going to take a quick drink break here, if you don't mind. Okay. So now we're going to start with the base image for the, of the girl's face here. And as I said in the first demo, I showed how to use, and we have to convert this to a black and white to create a displacement map. Uh, so as I showed you in the first demo, we did that with a black and white adjustment layer. In the second demo, I showed you could also achieve it by using a gradient map adjustment layer to create the black and white displacement map. In this demo, what I want to do is show you how to use channels to make the black and white adjustment layer. So let's try that here. So what we're going to do is up here next to layers is where it says there's a tab that says channels. So left click on that. And yours might be laid out differently depending on how you have your Photoshop laid out. But just look for the tab that says Channels. If you don't see that Channels tab, what you can do is don't panic. It's not like it's missing from your Photoshop. Go over to the top of the interface to the Window menu. Come down and just be sure to click on where it says Channels. And that will open up a Channels for you. So if it's not showing as one of your tabs, that's one way you can get it to show. Okay, so we're in the Channels panel. And what we want to do is you can see what's in the Channels panel is we see the full RGB image. So that's all the full color image. And then we have that image broken down into the individual red, green, and blue channels. Okay. And what we want to do is to select the channel that will give us the most contrast. So let's look through them and see if we can figure out which of these has the most contrast. So let me, there's the red channel. So again, look at the image and you don't need to watch where I'm clicking unless you just want to say, but I've taken it off of RGB and now I have that eye icon 
only on the red channel to see how the red channel looks, and that's okay. Uh, and you can see in the process of doing this, it's converted it to a black and white. Let's compare the red to the green channel. So the eye icon is only on the green channel. It looks like it has definitely more contrast than the red channel. And now let's try... Ah, so for me, the blue channel, I think, has... Yeah, the most contrast, because again, we're trying to get a lot of contrast so that we get the ripples, the bump, the sur surface definition um, humps, as it were, uh, so that we can build the map for the text or the graphic to wrap around. So we want a lot of definition and sort of three-dimensionality from the two-dimensional image to build the displacement map with. So for my image, the blue channel will be the best. You're going to have to tell for your image uh, what it is. So just trial and error. Once you figure out which is the most contrasty channel for your image, right click on the that active. So that channel, blue channel for me is active. I've got the blue highlight showing in there. Right click in there. And again, you see it's a slightly different menu than you saw before and slightly different wording, but we want to do the same thing. Choose Duplicate Channel and left click when that's highlighted and it'll bring up this little Duplicate Channel pop-up box. And again, you ignore where it says As and go straight to Destination Document. And what you want to do is come across to the little down arrow and select New. So the document should say New and it gives you the option to fill in a name, and I highly recommend that you fill in the name of your displacement map. So um, I'm going to call this Girl Face Displacement Map. Okay, and it, you can see it gives you the option to invert it. I definitely don't want to invert it for mine, and it's saving it as an Alpha 1 channel, so we'll click on that as OK. All right, so now what we have to do is the same thing we've done for the other two, which is to separate because it overlays them and you want to be able to see what you're working with here. So um, I definitely want to not be working with the girl face, which is over here. <laughs> I want to be working on the girl face displacement map. So for my taste, I like to block it out so I don't <laughs> goof and work on the wrong thing. Okay, so we've got our image by using the contrasty channel is now converted to a black and white, which is the first step that we need to do in order to create a displacement map. So now, and we already picked the most contrasty channel, so we've already handled the black and white and the contrast, so now we need to go to the step of adding a hint of Gaussian blur. So with that alpha channel active, come up to the top of the interface to filter, blur, down to Gaussian blur. So filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and click on that. And we get our Gaussian blur pop-out box. And I realize that because I'm talking through all and narrating all this, it seems like an awful lot, but it's honestly, it's only like eight basic steps that you'll go through. So once you get them, or you can write them down once you go through the video, it's following the same procedure over and over. It's really not that onerous to go through it. Okay, so again, what we want to do, I'm going to pull out a little bit by, because I have the preview on, I'm going to use my little zoom out just so I can see her features a little better. And I'm going to use her nose as the example. Now, she has a lot of, let me just go down here so you can see, freckles and little bumps and things going on in her face and, you know, just kid's skin that it's not perfect. So what I want to do is give this enough of a subtle Gaussian blur that we keep the main shapes like the nose, the eyes, the brows, any bend in her cheeks, around the lips, under her lips, the chin, um, any shapes there. We want to kind of try to keep the dimensionality without any of the surface texture that's going to get distracting to the displacement map. So I'm going to start moving the radius of pixels up slowly because the more I pull it to the right, the blurrier it's going to get and I'll release it from time to time just to see. OK, 
getting close here. That might be a little too blurry. Why don't I leave it there? Because I feel like it's not going to be as obvious to the displacement map um, what the freckles are in that, but we're keeping a good shape to big structures, let's call it like that, on the face. So once you get your level of blur so that you're keeping the big structures, the wrinkles, the ridges, whatever, um, intact, and the other surface stuff softened out so it doesn't get picked up, click OK. All right, so we've got the blur. Uh, if you want to add a little levels adjustment for a little bit more contrast after adding the blur, you can. So that's Control or Command L to bring up a levels box here. And let's just add a little bit more contrast to the midtones just to be sure that the map will wrap the text properly. Okay, and once you get that you can adjust the shadows, midtones, or highlights depending on your image. I just adjusted the midtones for the alpha channel. Click OK to accept that. Okay, I'm going to take another quick sip here. Sorry. All right, so now we want to save this as a displacement map. So with that layer, alpha layer active, after making all the adjustments to create the map, we go to File, Save As, click. For me, I want to be sure it's on the desktop. We've already got the file name because it was entered earlier. And just ensure that it's going to be a .psd file and save. OK, so now we have saved that to the desktop. So now we can make this one smaller and put it aside just like what I did with the other displacement map adjustments. Get that out of the way. I can make her a little smaller and just shrink that down. Okay. And now click on your main image to activate it again. So again, we're back on my original image. Now you can see that she was a full color image and she's still black and white. That's because in the channels panel on the right, we're still on blue channel. So what you need to do is click to be sure that you activate RGB again, bring back all of your colors. So these three channels make up the RGB. So just be sure you're on, got RGB activated then go back to the Layers tab and click on the Layers tab and be sure that you're on her face. So now you're ready with your base image to move in your flat graphic. So we already duplicated this. We're ready to move in the text in my case or the graphic in yours, whatever it's going to be. Um, go to the toolbar. Make sure that your Move tool is active. That's the cross, and it's got the highlight behind the black highlight. Behind it, oops, did we not have that active? There we go. See, you learn things. <laughs> so make sure that your layer that you want to move is active, and get your Move tool on, and then you'll see the pink bounding box that allows you to move this graphic over into the, over onto this background image. So left click and drag. And you can see <laughs> that it's pretty tiny. But uh, before we do anything, what we want to do as we've done in the other images is convert this flat graphic into a smart object. And my hand is going here. <laughs> so I right click on this layer. And we're going to come down to where it says Convert to Smart Objects. So right click on Active Layer, text, a graph, like Graphics Layer, come down to Convert to Smart Object. It'll add the Smart Object icon. And now we can resize so that this text would fit over her face. Or you can resize whatever graphic you're working with so that it fits over whatever base element image you want it to fit, fit over. So with that layer active, I'll come over to Edit, either Transform and Scale or Free Transform. 
and you get the bounding boxes so you can again you want to retain the aspect ratio so either press and hold shift and enlarge or just pull depending on how your Photoshop is set up. And again, because it's uh, difficult, you can't see with the flat graphic over it, what I do is I come over to my Layers panel on the right, I lower the opacity so I can see the image below and help me to line this up. So let me see where I want this to be. I kind of like that word behind, between her eyes. <laughs> okay, so once you get it lined up and you can, um, if you want to adjust it a little bit in this kind of an image, it's not going to matter. If it gets a little bit distorted. Okay, so once it is lined up where you want, then put the opacity back to 100% over in the Layers panel. Then click the check mark at the top to uh, accept the transform. There we go. And I'm going to put this back to my neutral lasso tool. And so now we have our flat graphic moved over onto our base image. And we want to apply the displacement map to the flat graphic. So with the flat graphic layer active, we go up to the top of the interface to filter, come down to distort, and fly out to displace. So filter, distort, displace. Press that. And uh, this was set from the previous demo. So I think this is going to be a little bit too much uh, distortion for her. So let's maybe for her start you can start at the base 10 if you want for yours, but let me just try a 12 and see um, how this will do for this image and click OK. So once you've made your distortion adjustments or amount of uh, distortion or displacement, that magnitude of displacement that you want, click OK. And now we have to grab the displacement map that will be used for her. So it's the girl's face. Open. And you can see it totally started bending this. So um, I think given how much it has bent it, I think I'll just leave it at that 12 for now. For your taste, you might want it more than what this is going to do, but we can just see what it does. OK, so we've applied that. So now we have to go to what I've called the finishing stage. And normally I said, well, look at the masking, but I am not going to do the masking that's needed in this case since I want it only on her face until we see if it has distorted and is in a size or a shape that we want first. So we're going to go to the other two finishing steps for displacement mapping too. First one is we're going to apply a blend mode. So let's go over to the layers panel to where it says normal to the a little down arrow for those and we're going to choose Oh, that's kind of nice. A blend mode. Oh, that's darker. Let's sort of partly remove. So again, this is what it says. It's trial and error. Just mouse over them, and you'll see the impacts of the different. Yeah, now see, these are no good. Oh, so if you want something funky, some of these ones in this uh, category down here can do really funky interesting ah so I don't want it for this image but if you did something where you had a black background or did something interesting it might be kind of a cool thing <laughs> all right uh, but I'm going to go back to the category with darken and multiply that's multiply is too dark for my taste same thing with linear burn so it's either darker color or darken let me just use darken okay so pick the blend mode uh, that you want to use to apply and further blend in your displacement map and flat graphic with your base image. Okay, so that's good for my taste. 
Then the next thing you want to do is, as a finishing step always with this displacement mapping, is to lower the opacity um, if needed or however much needed. So again, it's to taste. There's no formula. So right across from the blend mode is opacity. And I'm going to lower this a little bit just because I like her face to keep shining through. You could be watching the image versus the layer. We just go, oh yeah, it's just too light. Uh, I'm just back and forth. Okay, so I think I'll just leave it light like that because um, I like the idea of it being on her face, but I want her face because she's very striking looking, especially with those eyes, to stand out. So I'll just leave mine there. Okay, so now... This is when, since I've got it here, I'm going to use that final finishing step of do I need to mask away some of where the flat graphic with, was added? And the answer for me and my image is yes. So uh, because I don't want, I only want this wrapping around her face. I don't want it on her clothes and I don't want it on her eyes or, or certain parts of her face. So with that flat graphic layer active, come down to the bottom of the layers panel to the square with the circle, which is the add layer mask. And you can see now it's adding a white mask, which means it's revealing everything on that layer, including all the text. You know the mask is active because it's got the white frame around it. And we want to selectively hide some of the flat graphics. So that means we're going to use the brush tool from the toolbar. That's this one that looks like a paintbrush. And we want to paint with black as a foreground color onto the white mask to hide. Let me make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see where the paint. Okay, so I've got the brush tool active. I'm painting with black and I'm only painting uh, on the mask. Let's make my brush a little bigger. So let me get over here so you can see it. I'm right bracket key to make the brush bigger. And I'm going to paint away any of that flat graphic from her hair because it doesn't need to be there from the clothing. So I want it to be wrapping around her face. This, I think, is distracting here. You just gotta have got to do this to taste with your own image. So, and if you do overpaint um, with the black, you can hit the X key and that'll flip the color picker to white and you can paint something back in on the mask. And then just go back to the black again if by hitting the X key again. I don't like these because it looks like a little goatee on her chin. We don't need that there. So I'm going to just keep painting away anything that I think doesn't look like it needs to be there on her hair or just other places on her face or clothes. I'm going to paint it off of her eyes because I think that's not needed. I sort of like the squiggles below her eyes because it goes with her eyelashes, but definitely not on the eye. I don't know if this is needed here. And this right here I think is a little... So that's a case where I might make that a little smaller and paint back just a little bit of that there. Okay, and then I'm going to paint it off of her lips because I don't think that needs to be there. I'll just get this off from around her lips. Okay, so I'm not going to be too perfectionist about this because it's not the image you're going to work with, but you just get the point that um, let me show you the mask that was created. So anywhere where I painted with black, the flat text on that same layer is not going to show. And anywhere where it's white, anything where there is text is going to show. So we've managed to wrap this using the displacement map around her face. And I'm not going to go through the steps again, but if you do want a greater distortion and a greater bends um, around for the displacement around the uh, features in the object you're working with, you would just double click on this layer right here where it says displace. It'll pop open that parameters box that'll let you change the numbers. You do that, then it'll ask you to reapply the displacement map, and then it'll take you back to here, and you can have a greater displacement. So at this point, to create a displacement map that takes you from her flat face to graphics 
in this case text racked around it, we've completed all of the steps that need to be done to do that. Optionally, you can again always go on to do your adjustment layers and add, you know, any other finishing you want to, maybe you want to add an overall color fill to this or something, you could do that in an adjustment layer. But let me show you something else that's a little bit more advanced and definitely optional. You do not need to do this as part of the displacement process, but I like you to learn new tools. So if you want to work with them, you can. So at this point, we are finished with the essential part of the demo and moving on to some bonus optional content here. Okay, so on that active layer, be sure that your graphic, your flat graphic is uh, thumbnail is active. So the white frame needs to be around it. And what I want to show you how to do is how to work with the puppet warp. So let me come back here. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so puppet warp creates a mesh over the entire face and it lets you just subtly distort specific selective areas of your image. So let's say even by making those parameters changes that would make your displacement map bend a little bit more, it still might not be doing it exactly the way you want when it gets finished and you might want to customize it to your taste using the tool I'm going to show you now with the Puppet Warp will let you do that kind of customization. So again, Active Layer, Thumbnail with the Graphic Active, go up to Edit and come down about halfway to where it says Puppet Warp and left click on that when it's highlighted. And you can see what it's done to the image. So in the Options bar, for Puppet Warp, so these all these different things have their own options. I have it clicked up here so that there's a little check mark so that it says Show Mesh, and that's what this is. And I also have it set so that the defaults are Normal Mode, Density Normal, and Expansion 2 Pixels. So if you want it to expand when you change anything by more than 2 pixels, you have the flexibility to change that. If for the image you're working on, the normal mesh density isn't enough, you can come to this little down arrow and you can either add more points or fewer points so that if you don't want things moving around, I'm just going to leave it on normal and show mesh. So the way the Puppet Warp works, and you can definitely use it in different ways in different composites, but this is one way you can use it, is you have, you have little pins and what you want to do is pin down the portions of your image that you do not want to move around. There's a moral equivalent in liquify, which is freeze. <laughs> so it's like you're taking a push pin and you're going to put pins. So let me just start clicking here. Put a pin there. See the, with the little dot with the red in it? Put a pin here. So let me pull this over to the white area. So see where my yellow highlighter is? There's that little icon that looks like a push pin. So anytime you click, you're putting a little pin to keep that part of the image still so that it doesn't move around or it does move around. So I'm going to put a pin in various places just so that when I go to move things, the rest of the image stays still. And it will tell you if you are getting too many pins for the image, in which case then you can increase the density or decrease the density of the mesh. All right, so let me look around and see if there's a place. So here on her nose, um, it looks like this word fool bend, but let's say I wanted it to bend more than the displacement map let me bend it. So with all of these pins placed, you click on the pin for the area you want to move. And look what happened. The active pin has a red dot in the center. The rest of these are all white. So they're pinning her face to the board, as it were, so it won't move around. And this is now an active pin. So if you left click on that, you can gently start, look at this, see? Just, and this is why you can see how it moves, so I maybe want to put another pin over here. Um, if I want to move full so that it bends down a little bit more and distorts a little bit more, 
and then here maybe I want to push it up so it distorts up a little bit more and again I'm not doing it perfect but the point is to show you that if there are areas in your image that didn't distort or displace enough and you want to displace them you can set use the puppet warp tool set some pins and then click on the pins where you want to move but just be sure you know that the things you don't want to move are set so once you do your few custom displacements if you even want to do them then once you get it set the way you want you come to the top of the interface and click the check mark and the mesh goes away so now again we are still left with our original image of the girl and both the displacement map and the optional puppet warp warping of the flat graphic for the image so that is now the end of the third and final demo for this video so i just to wrap it up and summarize um, i showed you three different methods or three different tools in photoshop for how to create and and apply displacement maps to wrap flat graphics or conform flat graphics whether they are images such as illustrations, photos, whatever, or text around surface shapes in a base 2D image. So some of the tools that we covered, so if you look at all three demos, then you'll see that the tools that were used were a black and white adjustment layer, a gradient map adjustment layer, and channels panel, for help making the original displacement map. We looked at using filters to add a Gaussian blur to the displacement map. We looked at using the uh, filter for distort displace in order to apply the displacement map, use the move tool to move the flat graphics onto the base image to create the composite looked at using smart objects so that we can safely retain the resolution and the quality of our flat graphic as we resize it or do other modifications to it, used layer masking to get the flat graphic away from parts of the image where we don't want it to appear, and also looked at blend modes to help finish and apply the flat graphic so that it would conform it where it has conformed to the uh, base image is more visible and more realistic looking and then i also optionally showed you the tools that you don't need to use but can help with the finishing beyond the base finishing of blend if on the layer effects to help it look like what that uh, graffiti how it maybe is coming away from the wall or light is hitting something. So part of the graphic is going away by using that blend if capability. And then we just saw puppet warp as a way to, uh, from the edit menu, as a way to selectively maybe distort parts of the image a little bit more. So it was a lot of content, but um, as I said, it's, it's basically just eight steps, and then you can do those optional uh, finessing steps if you want to. So I'd say have fun, experiment with displacement maps, and see what you can do to add flat graphics sort of dimensionally to 2D images. Take care.